Welcome to WMG. Thanks a lot, Tom, for inviting me for this talk. And today I'm going to talk about lithium and battery and an issue with relaxation and how relaxation affect actually a EIS measurement. And later on, I'll just focus a little bit on how to test big sized lithium ion battery. And of course, the issue of testing a huge battery. So today, as I said, I'll just talk about uh, large size lithium ion battery cells and I'll talk about uh, connections and accuracy of the equipment, how it affects actually. And then we'll move to relaxation of lithium ion battery and we'll talk about short term and long term measurements. How it's affect, relaxation affect the measurements in short term and long term. And finally, I'll talk about some of the reliability issues because I have seen lots of EIS data in the literature which sometimes I asked myself, can I trust these results? Sometimes the answer was not, so I thought I will talk a little bit about reliability issues. So to start with, I think you all know th uh, these things, the different size of cells, but I thought like I'll start with these and give you an overview. Like if you have diff different type of cells, you have different capacity and different internal impedance too. So this will be a uh, key actually. You can see like large of cells has almost 52.4 milliohm internal resistance. Uh, compared to coin cells, which is 200 milliohm resistance. So there is quite a large difference of the internal impedance, and this will actually affect how you measure it. Here I put a chart from one of the Slurton case. So you can see 0.2% accuracy is very good, and we have up to 1 milliohm resistance. And please have a look to here to here. If you have an internal impedance of 0.1 to 1, suddenly you are measuring within 1% accuracy up to 10 hertz. So above 10 hertz, your accuracy is much lower. So this is one of the good example of the impedance accuracy of the equipment you will get from the market. So still, if you have a large pulse cell or large, large prismatic cell, you might be measuring on these strands. So when comparing these results or writing a, your observation as a journal paper <coughs> or a conference paper, you clearly need to mention this or think about this. Because lots of times you have seen in uh, literature, like the results are, has three to four percent of accuracy, but they comment on within the two percent variations, which is not valid. Or actually, <coughs> you cannot comment on that. Second thing is connections. There are lots of different ways you can connect equipments, your test equipment, with battery cells. Lots of times we have seen like connections are made with crocodile cleaves or lots of other cleaves. So we asked actually ourselves, is it a good way to test large lithium ion batteries? The answer was no, because they have very low impedance, like point we have seen 0 0.4 to 1.2 million. So there need to be very good uh, way of connecting battery cells to the equipment. And we developed a system like this here to connect battery cycling equipment and the EIS equipment so that we can have a consistent uh, connection all the time, every time we connect the equipment to the battery cell. And the connection resistance can be very, very low. Actually, in this way, we can find it, like the connection resistance, we can get it down to 0.1 million. So it might not be good enough for some of you who are testing very larger than these batteries or supercapacitors. But this was good enough for us for large battery cells we do test. Now com coming to the relaxation actually, we all are of our uh, voltage relaxation of lithium ion battery. Like when you discharge the battery like this one, and your voltage goes down, as soon as you stop discharging the battery, the voltage comes back. And now, this relaxation, we are out of this relaxation, but the impedance should change with this voltage change as well. But when I have seen lots of results in the literature, I, do, I didn't get that information. After adjusting a state of charge, when they did the test, they did the test here, or here, or here. But 
if I have done a test here and here, this is going to be the same, probably not. So this is actually what happens when you do a EIS test just shortly after you adjust a state of charge, for example, after you charge or discharge the battery. This is actually, this is not right actually, you can see like, uh, at just after adjusting a state of charge, or even after 10 seconds, 10 minutes of adjusting state of charge, because your system is changing. When you are measuring, it, your system is changing, and you don't want your uh, system to be changed during your measurement. If your system is changing, the measurements are not valid simply. But here, as the system is changing during the measurement, but in long term, the system is not changing, so that your shape is not there, but your EIS is still changing. So here the results are from 10 minutes to 15 hours. And the variation from here to here, like a couple of almost 10% variation. So your measurement results can vary up to 10% 10, 10 depending which position, actually when <coughs> you did your EIS test just after the state of charge adjustment. Uh, this is key because so far I have seen one or two papers which says we have done the EIS test after X amount of hour after adjusting instead of charge. And so if I do, so what we can do to make a consistent EIS test? We plotted something. This one's like, if you see this is pure ohmic resistance probably related to pure ohmic resistance. If we take this point here and call it total resistance or RD for example now, if I plot it here like this one, it's changing this way with time. Relaxation time when you do the EIS testing. In Warwick, in WMG, we have said, see it here, we set it four hour actually. After four hour, if you do with four to six hour, your measurement might be within actually the error limit actually of the equipment. It might be okay, but if you need very highly accurate results, you might wait until 15 hours or 10 hours to get it fully relaxed before you do the EIS test. But if you do just after one hour uh, or 30 minutes of adjusting your state of charge, your results might, uh, might be highly variable. So the results you do compare with, for especially during aging test, when you do a EIS test every couple a hundred cycles or every, periodically, this might not be the same same position, and your measurements has a uh, contribution from relaxation. We have published one paper on on this how these things varies and why it varies and uh, what you can do. And here is the reference. <coughs> anyone interested? And another issue I thought I will just point it out is the reliability issue. This is not our work. I picked it up from. The literature, it was done by one of the groups in Germany, and they have shown, like, if you have 18650 cells, which is connected in this way, on the top and bottom, the EIS measurement can be very localized on your 18650 cells. So these things need to be uh, taken in account when you do EIS test on large format cells. But for the power cells, this problem might not be there. But for the cylindrical cells, this issue will be there always. Because the cylindrical cells, the, the way the different part of the uh, electrodes are connected to the external tabs is different compared to your uh, power cells. And lots of times I was asked actually, lots of different uh, researchers told me like the impedance you are measuring by using pulse power test by applying a DC pulse like this in, your, in the right hand side picture in this picture. And uh, EIS is different. Then I ask myself, like, why they will be different? They're measuring the same thing. You're, you, uh, you're measuring the same battery, and it should be the same. But the problem, actually, is on the frequency, because the frequency response of the battery is not the same. So when you apply a DC pulse, your resistance simply is not different. So for example, here, I sh I'm showing here a result of the 5C discharge pulse results, and this discharge pulse was this type of discharge pulse, and it was a 10 second discharge pulse. So if you think of 10 second discharge pulse, most of the harmonics actually coming from 
uh, 0.1 hertz, 10 second is 0.1 hertz. So if you compare these results to uh, impedance at 0.1 hertz, it should be similar because Ohm's law should be persisting during your measurements. And at 0.1 hertz, whatever the current you are applying, it should measure the same resistance. Same, there should be a same voltage drop. So here, at different two different pulses, discharge and charge pulse and EIS, <coughs> we have found actually if you compare them to point one to an similar to here, point at point one hertz. But if you go ten millihertz, it's much higher. So we have another way uh, of measuring the impedance at pulse multi-sign using. Uh, point 0.1, uh, sorry, 10 millihertz, and we have found almost similar impedance here. So the a small variation between these two, these three, and these two might be down to measurement accuracy, but you are measuring almost similar thing. And uh, we actually submitted on paper based on these results, and it's currently under review. And when I do the measurements, actually in the lab, I say like I follow the rule of three, and also uh, tell this, actually whenever I train someone to do the EIS testing, first thing, at a particular frequency, whatever the current you are applying, it should follow the Ohm's law. If I apply too much current and my resistance is changing, that means by applying that amount of current, I'm changing the system itself, changing the electrochemistry within the battery. And there shouldn't be any electrochemical change within the system you're measuring, in this case, within the battery. That we have seen from our short-term relaxation results. As the battery internal electrochemistry within the battery was changing, uh, the measurement was not valid, actually. And third point is that the response signal is slowly, um, means due to actually, solely due to applied signals. When you apply a signal, you uh, apply, for example, a current signal or voltage signal, your resultant voltage or current signal can be different, slightly different, not only down to applied signal. For example, if you change the cables, or if you just move the cables, your resultant signal might be slightly different. So if you have that contribution from a different source, your measurements are not valid. So usually these three rules we follow to make a consistent EIS test. I ask sometimes a couple of questions to myself when before doing an EIS test. Like what signals or current or voltage signal should I use? What current or voltage signal will not change my system? And what need to be, uh, we do lots of actually <coughs> low temperature tests because your impedance goes high uh, especially for lithium ion battery, if you do a test at very low temperature, your impedance goes up. So there are lots of temptation actually do the EIS test of low temperature. So what we need to account for at low temperatures, what's happening there? What type of test jigs we need to use to connect ourselves to the test equipment? And what equipment circuit should we use to analyze our results? So if I conclude, EIS is a simple, non-destructive test. That's why lots of us will use it. But, and it packs with lots of information. Easy to analyze with a equivalent circuit, simple equivalent circuit, but can be completely misleading if you don't do it properly. Thank you.